Hey, Facebook family. Um, happy Thursday evening. <laughs> I'm a little tardy. Um, don't judge me. Some of you on Facebook already know why I'm a little tardy. Um, I had the opportunity today to um, hang out with a um, dear and cherished colleague, Dr. Benjamin Chavis. Um, and uh, you know, when you're in that kind of company, you just kind of need to take your time, right? That's the situation you just can't rush. And so um, I was so appreciative of having an opportunity to get with him um, while he's in town for the Taste of Soul. For those of you who may not know what's going on this weekend, Taste of Soul. And um, Dr. B Dr. Benjamin Chavis is um, over the National Black Publishers Association, in other words, all the black newspapers. And uh, the local newspaper, the LA Sentinel, I think is behind Taste of Soul. So he's here for all of those festivities and we had an opportunity to hang out and um, chop it up a little bit. So I tried my best to do my LAPD pursuit train driving <laughs> to cut through that traffic and get back here as close to five as I could and well not so much because you see it's almost seven. Hey Tonda sister girl what's up? Thank you so much for um, writing a recommendation on my um, fan page. I appreciate that and so for anybody else who might be so inclined and don't know that that's something you can do if you want to share with the world um, why you think I'm amazing <laughs> or why not. Um, you can do that on Sergeant Dorsey Speaks fan page or retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey public page, public figure page, whatever they call it, um, on Facebook. You can do that. So um, thank you, Tonda. I really appreciate you. So um, let me, um, I've already shared this on my timeline. You know, I came to you guys earlier this morning and I had to ask. I'm going to continue to do that. Share this on your timeline and um, we'll talk about that thing that I'm going to be worrying you about for the next week or so. Um, before we get started, I want to um, say thank you, thank you to my, um, my subbies. You guys are amazing. And there's a lot of new subbies. I appreciate you guys. Um, however you found me, I'm happy about it. And listen, now that you found me new subbies, I need you to tell a friend. I'm trying to reach a goal in the next week. I'm just going to say in the next week because I want to create a sense of urgency about it. I'm trying to get to 10,000 uh, YouTube subscribers. And, you know, for those of you who frequent YouTube, you know that's no easy feat, right? So um, do what you can um, to share my YouTube site with uh, friends and family. I'm asking everybody who hears my voice to bring three friends over and have them subscribe to Sergeant Dorsey Speaks YouTube. I would really, really appreciate it. And um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the reason I'm kind of begging is because opportunities come with large numbers. So there you have it. For those of you who are brand spanking new and don't know what this is all about, I am retired LAPD Sergeant, 20 years, uh, all in patrol. And so I come to you every week and kind of talk about what's trending in the news, um, things that I think um, you may not know about that's going on around the nation with regards to police and community interaction, reaction, uh, what you might need to do to make sure that you survive that police encounter if you get stopped, because remember, holding court curbside could get you hurt. I also talk about um, how you can complain if you're not happy with the level of service that you receive because there's a policy, uh, there's a procedure in place. And if you just do that, um, you may just survive that police encounter. Because at the end of the day, the goal is for everybody to go home, the officers and you. So um, that's why I'm here. This is what we do. And we do this every Thursday live at 5 p.m. Pacific on the West and 8 p.m. Pacific on the East. So um, let's, uh, let's get to it. I'm just going to start right off with the um, 
with the foolishness over in um, Fort Worth. You guys, you knew it wasn't gonna be long, right? Listen, I knew when that interim police chief, Ed Krause, you know, came out whining and crying and sniffling and saying how, you know, bad he felt. Well, I'm not in his heart, so I don't know that he didn't feel bad. I just don't know who he felt bad for because now, you know, they have tossed this eight-year-old into the fray, if you will. And um, there's something in the affidavit, the arrest affidavit for Aaron Dean, the officer who resigned before he could be fired, that speaks to the eight-year-old allegedly saying, now this is the police saying that the eight-year-old said it, because you know we don't believe for a minute that this eight-year-old said this, but now they're saying that the eight-year-old said he saw his aunt, a Tatiana Jefferson, reach into her purse, get the gun, and then point it at the window. I call bullshit because listen, um, there've been several different angles of that moment when the officer said, um, you know, show me your hands, show me your hands, whatever he was yelling out. And then he fired like a second later. You see someone come to the window and the image is kind of blurred, but you see someone come to the window and you see them kind of raise the mini blind up, right? So I would imagine, you know, I don't know what hand she's using. The way the video looks, she could be using her right hand. I don't know if a Tatiana is right hand dominant or not, but let's just say she was using her right hand. If she's right hand dominant, I mean, if I'm going to raise blinds, I'm going to use my right hand. Um, then she can't be holding the gun in it, right? Because if you're right hand dominant, your, your hand is busy. Um, if she's left hand dominant, my, my guess is she's probably still kind of trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I'm sorry, if left hand is used to raise the blind and that's not her dominant hand, I just don't see her, um, unless she's been spending a lot of time on the range, <laughs> pulling up the blind and pointing the gun all at the same time. It just doesn't ring true. And listen, to put this baby in that mess and say that, um, you know, this is what the child says, you know, almost gives the inference that now, so what are you guys going to do if this thing goes to trial? And I don't think it's going to go to trial. I believe absolutely they're going to settle. But let's just say there could be a deposition before this thing settles to kind of see what this eight-year-old would say. And so you're going to put this baby through that interim chief, Ed Cross? Is that what you're going to do? You're going to have this baby in an environment where he's being asked something on top of all the trauma that he's already had to deal with? Because you want to prove a point. You want to say that, whoa, hold up, wait a minute now, wait a minute. Uh, the officer, he really did perceive a threat because that's what he said, right? He perceived a threat. And just in case that story doesn't work, because they're floating a lot of different stories, be clear. Just in case that doesn't work, now we're being told, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It wasn't really a welfare check, y'all. It was an open door, open structure call. Tomato, tomato. You call it what you want. Because at the end of the day, whatever the call was, <laughs> when you respond to it, you got to bring a little common sense, a little good judgment with you. And hopefully you bring your training along. And so now, you know, it's been reported that um, it's saying that information came from the neighbor uh, to the call takers to dispatch. And while it was relayed to dispatch, it was determined to be an open structure call. Ooh, that makes it much more... Um, high priority, much more, um, you know, everybody's on alert, right? Much more, um, ooh, super snooper kind of stuff, right? According to Ed Cross. Okay, Ed, I see what you're doing, sir. So um, they also said that, well, okay, so now it's an open structure call. The neighbor also said that, well, the damn door had been open since 10 p.m. It's two o'clock. That's not normal. So I don't know what's going on. And the neighbor also said, and oh, by the way, both of their cars are in the driveway. So let's go with, it's an open structure call and that changes the whole scenario because now the officer's spidey senses are all heightened. Okay, so the neighbor said both cars are in the driveway that belong to the residents. All the lights are on. Both doors to the residents are open. And it's been that way for now about four hours. So listen, 
I don't care how the call came in. I don't care what they term it. It changes nothing because at the end of the day, you know, dispatch, call takers, whatever you want to call them, do the best that they can to get information from the person reporting. And you hope you get good information because we know that sometimes the people who call in are not giving accurate information, are not being truthful. You know, the whole living while black, you know, black folks over here, you know, settle lemonade when they don't have a permit or they barbecue it and their coals are a little too hot. <laughs> Whatever stupid thing it is that they say. So police have to use a little common sense when they respond to the calls. You have this basic information. And so now as we're responding, we're, we're observing, we're looking around, we're trying to figure out what we're seeing as we park some distance away, which is what they did, and walk up to the residence. You never want to park in front. You park some distance away and you walk up because in your walking up, you're observing. That's what we're trained to do. And when you finally get to that structure where there's this open structure call, you're looking for evidence of a break-in, a burglary, a broken window, a kicked-in door jam, and you see none of that. So listen, I know what Ed's trying to do. He's trying to figure out if he can erase a couple of zeros on that check that they're in the back writing by mitigating the call and saying that it wasn't a welfare check. This was a little something different. This was a, you know, possible burglary, which means, you know, that means that um, it's, it's, it's a high risk and it, it would be reasonable for the officer to, um, you know, have his gun in his hand and shoot through a window. But let's go with that. Let's go with it was a burglary. It's a high risk call. Then if you're there with your partner, because if it were me and it's a high risk call and I, there's an open structure, I promise you, I'm not going to go in there with just one other person, my partner, because I don't know how many bedrooms are in there. I don't know the layout. I don't know the configuration. So since it's a high priority call and their spider senses were all tingly, wouldn't it make sense then for Officer Dean to freeze frame because there's no urgency, the door has been open since 10, back up, get on his radio and request additional units, open structure. I need a couple more units over here because I need more officers than just this one female partner standing next to me before we try to make entry or as we circle the building of this open structure call. So I don't know if they're just floating, um, you know, stuff to see, you know, what, what sounds like a go, or if they're just thinking we're stupid <laughs> and just say an idiot dumb thing because, well, you know, nine times out of 10, when the police chief holds a press conference, he just blurts out stuff. Nobody ever says, um, excuse me, sir, I've got questions. I would love to be there so I could raise my hand and say, I've, I've got questions, sir. Um, can we talk about that open structure call and what would be the proper protocol? What should an officer do on an open structure call? So Fort Worth, the next time they have a community meeting, if they let you talk, ask them, you know, how are officers trained? to respond to an open structure call? Would it have been prudent for them to get back up rather than go up to a window and peer in and shine a flashlight in someone's face? And if you've never had that done, I can tell you, those flashlights are really, really bright. And the moment that you shine it in somebody's face, they can't see. They don't know what's going on on the outside. They don't even know who's on the other end of that bright light. So now that you've blinded them, and we understand that we're blinding you, that's why we do it, right? Because we want the advantage. I'm looking at you and you can't see me because I'm blinding you with my light. What's the urgency? Who are you? Let me get a good look. I got a good light on you. Who is that? Is there anything in her hand? It's offensive. And... Um, That's their story, and maybe they'll stick to it. I don't know. We'll see. But that's what's being floated right now. And so since they're coming out with all these different versions and, you know, 
what ifs and how comes that lets me know that as much as interim chief Ed Cross says he wants to be open and transparent and he wants there to be accountability, I'm hearing a little double talk. I'm hearing a little double talk. And so I'm not really sure um, if he is um, being honest in what he says about his intentions. So um, for those of you that are there, hey, uh, Sister Beachy, what's up? Maria, thank you, thank you for um, being so responsive. I appreciate you. Um, for those of you that are in Fort Worth, if you get an opportunity to ask those questions, as you hear me talking, if I were there, this is what I would be asking. So if you get a chance, please do ask and listen. We know that over in Fort Worth, this is, um, I've heard six shootings this year, nine shootings this year. Either number is, is, is you know, too much. One, one death is too much, right? And we know, you know, from things that are being reported that, you know, there's kind of a little history over there on Fort Worth Police Department with, re with regards to um, use of force, deadly force, and this is not anything new. This has been going on for a minute. It was reported back in 2008 that there was a, a black man by the name of Michael Patrick Jacobs, 2008. And uh, he was 24 years old at the time. He was in uh, mental distress and he died after officers tasered him. Why? Well, because Michael Patrick Jacobs' family called the police like a Tatiana's neighbor did, asking for some assistance, asking for help. And the officers showed up and, you know, effectively killed their, their 24 year old son back in 2008. And then um, a couple of years later, the city did what they always do. They got a big old bucket full of money and they were like, family, here you go, two million for you. Will that tide you over? Will that quiet you up? Will that calm the natives? until we do something again, because you know we're gonna do something again, right? And so they didn't disappoint because in 2016, there was a gentleman by the name of David Colley who was shot in the back after an officer accused him of pointing a weapon at him. Uh, now, David Colley didn't die, but he's paralyzed from the waist down now. And uh, David denies pointing a weapon. Great deference is given to an officer's version you know, if they'd have probably just, you know, aimed that bullet a little further to the left or the right instead of paralyzing David, maybe they would have killed him. And we would know what he would have to say, like a Tatiana or like Botham Jean. We, we don't know what they had to say about what was going on and what they were doing or what they weren't doing, right? So um, David um, was shot, paralyzed. And uh, whatever it was that they went there for initially, whatever reason they engaged, encountered David, because they ultimately arrested him. Because I tell you all the time, once the police put hands on you, you got to go to jail for something. <laughs> Interfering is usually the go-to, resisting, and sometimes battery on a police officer. Whatever it was that they charged David with after they paralyzed him, you know what they did with those charges? They dismissed them. Why? I don't know. Um, maybe because they were bogus to begin with. Uh, maybe because they manufactured probable cause or reasonable suspicion to engage David to begin with. And then they lied and said he pointed a gun at him and they paralyzed him when they shot him. Once it got to the district attorney, they were like, ooh, yeah, not so much with this one. We're going to have to go ahead and drop those charges. Now, the officer that was involved in that particular situation was ultimately suspended for 10 days, not fired, suspended, and he's still on the job. He's still on the job, on the job. Um, and then there was another incident about a year after that. There was a woman, um, black woman, who officers um, used a taser on. Her name is Dorshe Morris. Officers used a taser on her. Um, they deemed that uh, the force was unreasonable. 
Now, Ms. Morris called the police asking for help. I'm starting to see a pattern here, y'all. Maybe we, maybe y'all ought to quit calling the police when you need help. Maybe you need to just figure some of this stuff out on your own. Maybe you ought to just try that for a minute or two before you actually call the police. I'm just saying. Uh, Ms. Morris was having a situation with her boyfriend. It was a domestic violence dispute. She called the police. She asked for help. Police showed up. And I don't know why, I don't know why they got mad at Ms. Morris, but they did. And they tasered her. And they decided that the force was unreasonable. The officer was eventually fired. They fired the officer in this situation. But something happened with either, you know, the way in which they fired him he was reinstated. So that officer is also back, free to roam about the cabin. You guys really got a lot of folks you need to pay attention to and watch out for over there in uh, Fort Worth. And um, listen, all of this stuff has been going on. Now, I know that some of you were talking um, about this on my YouTube channel with regards to Joel Fitzgerald. That was the uh, black police chief that they had over there. They ran him out on a rail back in May of this year. And you guys remember me talking about, you know, Joel and, you know, some of the shenanigans that he was involved in. And he was involved in some shenanigans, be clear. He tried to go over to Baltimore to be the commissioner and they found out he, he had lied on his application and puffed up his resume. And he had some stuff going on back in Fort Worth with his son and it was a mess. So uh, Baltimore said, mm, not so much. Um, so they sent Joel back. And then he went to prom week over at um, the National Police Memorial week-long hoedown that they have every year and got into some kind of verbal altercation or near fist fight with one of the presidents of their union because allegedly he was in the police officer's union and he wasn't supposed to be, so they kicked him out. And it was just a hot mess. And so I don't know if Joel Fitzgerald is the problem or if he just makes it easy for them to say he's a problem because he kind of does stupid stuff. I'm just saying, I don't know. It just looks that way. But having said all of that, he was the police chief um, since 2015 when some of these shenanigans and uses of force and other deadly uses of force occurred. So, you know, I say all the time that, you know, in a lot of instances, really, I really can't take race completely out of the, out of the equation because it, it, it doesn't matter if it's a black police officer, white police officer, black chief, white chief. It's officers who are drunk with power. It's police chiefs who circle the wagons, minimize and mitigate bad behavior without regard for ethnicity because their job is to protect the organism the entity, they know in some instances, in a lot of instances, when it's a bad shooting and they know that, you know, we're probably gonna have to cut a check to the family. So how do we minimize um, the amount of that check? They already know we gotta write a check. It's not their money, it's taxpayer money, but they know a check is gonna be written. And so it's like, okay, so what do we do? It's not that I really like Aaron Dean, I don't really care about him, or I don't really care about Amber Geiger, or um, the officer who was fired, and I can't say his name because I don't know it, um, it's not in here. But my point is, is that, you know, the officers may benefit, but not because of some great love that the chief has for the officer, it's the chief protecting the entity, the organism. And every now and again, an officer will benefit. And every now and again, they'll make an example of one, like Aaron Dean like um, Laquan McDonald, like Mohammed Noor, like Roy Oliver, right? Every now and again, they'll, they'll go ahead and sacrifice one of their own just to calm you guys down. <laughs> and they'll throw money at the family. And once they do, the family has to be quiet because they generally sign a stipulation saying they're not going to, you know, have, it, have anything to say uh, once they've been given money. That's just what happens. And... Um, then it's business as usual. <coughs> Party hats for everybody. What, what are we changing? Why would we? This is working. Taxpayers pay. Officers, some stay, some go. They get other jobs if they leave. 
And then, you know, everybody forgets and they're, they're not stomping around the streets. They're not laying across the Santa Monica freeway anymore until it happens again. And then the cycle just repeats itself, right? It just repeats itself. So, um, listen, I don't know what the answer is. I know there's not one thing that's going to fix it. This I know, um, but we got to do something. And so the little bitty steps that I offer to you, you know, are steps that I think we should take. Attend meetings, ask questions, um, you know, vote for people in positions of authority that um, think the way you do, um, are concerned about the things that you're concerned about. I say it all the time. Every mayor serves at the pleasure of a police chief or a city manager. A little bird told me that um, Mayor Price, I believe is her name over there in Fort Worth, is talking to the city manager, uh, David Cook, about setting up um, some kind of a independent review panel to take a look at what's going on over there on the uh, Fort Worth Police Department. You know what I did this morning, family? I spent a significant portion of my morning trying to get in touch with some local activists and clergy that were reported in a newspaper um, who um, are demanding some things be done because I wanted to reach out and, and uh, holler at uh, a couple of them. So um, if anybody knows, um, let's see, let me tell you who I was trying to talk to today. If you guys know these gentlemen, uh, you might want to let them know that I'm here and that I am looking to have a conversation with them. Just give me one second while I try to find out. Um, who these gentlemen are. I left a message uh, on the church answering machine for these two, um, these two gentlemen. Um, and I have not heard back today. So uh, B.R. Daniels, Pastor B.R. Daniels is one of them. Um, I think it's called, let me see. I'll tell you the name of the church as soon as my <laughs> slow computer uh, populates the doggone story. Okay, let's see. Um, so they had this community meeting at this church. And there were several, they said it was about 10, 10 or so. Pastor B.R. Daniels at Beth Eaton Baptist Church was one who said, you know, we're really tired of this and this has got to stop. And so um, I reached out to uh, Pastor B.R. Daniels. Um, I left a message at him at his church as well as um, on Facebook because he has a Facebook presence. And then um, there's another. I um, to speak to the public in public about ugh, this case. Hold and on. It is eerily similar to what happened to both Jean, the unarmed man. Killed hold on, hold on, hold on. Then there's another gentleman um, who I try to find today. And I also reached out to uh, the city manager, David Cook, and to the mayor and just said, hey, y'all, um, if you really, really, <laughs> if you really, really want to do something different, I have an idea. And here's my number. Give me a call. We'll talk. I'm waiting to hear back. I have it. Um, so for those of you that are in Fort Worth, if any of you are in Fort Worth and you're involved with some of these groups or some of these churches, and um, you have um, a way to get in touch with these people, you know how to get in touch with me, please, please share my information with them and just let them know that there's someone out there who is um, who's very much interested in being a part of the, the process to make things better. Um, you know right now, because I'm trying to tell you this, I can't... Um, cannot, cannot <laughs> find the story that had the names of these two churches. One of my YouTube subbies shared it with me. And um, yeah, this is not happening, family. But, uh, but for those of you that are on the ground, 
you may already know who I'm talking about. Um, let me do one other thing. There was, um, like I said, it was in um, the newspaper there. And I'm sure that there's going to be other opportunities where there will be meetings held. And um, yeah, just tell them, um, tell them to check the voicemail at church. <laughs> there's a crazy lady who's trying to get a hold of them and um, has some ideas about what might make things better. B.R. Daniels is one and the other gentleman is... Um, ooh. see Rodney McIntosh I know you guys think I'm crazy I'm really not um yeah Rodney McIntosh Rodney McIntosh is the other person who um I reached out to and he has a church Christ the Risen King is his church Christ the Risen King Church in Fort Worth Dallas and then um the first one that I told you, B.R. Daniels. So um, I reached out to both of them and, um, you know, we'll just see what happens. Now, look, I like um, the weather here in California, but I've been thinking about it. And if, if, if an opportunity presented itself where I could um, have the kind of impact with a police department, a city manager, a mayor, if I could share with them the things that I share with you every week, I might be willing to have a summer home in Fort Worth. <laughs> I'm going to look into it and uh, you guys do the same. If you, uh, if you um, run across any of these people that I'm sharing with you right now, let them know that I'm here. Send them to um, www.sgtsherildorsey.com. Okay. So, um, Anyway, let's see. What else? What else? What else? What else? Okay. Um, so there was another incident over in uh, Fort Worth, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, aside from the ones that I told you about. So we know that these things are not new. We know that there have been problems that are ongoing. Um, I don't know that there are going to be any civil rights investigation relative to this case for the reasons that we've talked about before. This current administration has no appetite, in my mind. A.G. Barr, I don't know that he has any appetite really to do anything uh, with regards to errant police officers and uses of force and all of that stuff. So um, don't hold your breath. Now, I also saw something, and I'll share this with you because someone is asking that folks contact Representative Nicole Collier there in Austin, Texas, and there's a telephone number, 512-463-0716. She has a website of Nicole.Collier, C-O-L-L-I-E-R, at house.texas.gov. And uh, it's kind of a call to action for the um, people that are there within um, this woman's jurisdiction, I guess, if you will, to contact her and just um, let her know that this whole thing about an eight-year-old saying a gun was pointed and you know, the radio call was not a welfare check. It was a open structure, really has no bearing. And and, and please, um, Ms. Collier, make sure that um, you keep an eye on this pending investigation. Folks are not really trusting and for a good reason. Now, over in uh, Georgia, I had some family members mention this to me and I hadn't heard this story before, but there was a young man by the name of Anthony Hill He's a mentally ill young man. He was naked when he was killed, naked and unarmed when he was killed by a Georgia police officer. And that Georgia police officer has just been found, what? Not guilty of murder on Monday. Um, the officer, whose name is um, Olson, was initially charged with killing 26-year-old Anthony Hill, who was an Afghanistan war veteran. And this happened back in 2015. And so this thing has been working its way through the system. And um, just on last week, Robert Chip Olson is the officer from DeCaleb County, was found not guilty of the murder, but he was found guilty of aggravated assault, making a false statement, which means he lied, and two counts of violation of oath. 
Now, I don't know if the officer is going to be able to keep his job. I don't even know he hasn't been sentenced yet if he's going to um, receive you know, any prison time. Obviously, if he receives prison time, then it's an easy fix. Um, he's going to have to go. He'll be sentenced on November the 1st. He's facing up to 35 years on the aggravated assault, making a false statement and two counts of violation of oath. I would argue that if, um, you know, the making of the false statement, if he doesn't do prison time, making a false statement should be a disqualifier in terms of him staying on the job. But, you know, they do what they do, right? They, they, they give us one thing and we get all excited. You know, they find him guilty for one thing, not guilty for murder, but guilty for making a false statement. Really? And, uh, you know, then they give him a slap on the hand in terms of a penalty. So kind of like Amber Geiger, right? A compromise verdict. Jury found her guilty, but then said, yeah, we're just going to give you, you know, a couple of years and uh, it'll all be good. So I don't know what's going to happen with this officer Olson in the uh, murder of Anthony Hill over in Georgia. But uh, after November 1st, once he's sentenced and it becomes known, I'll come back and I'll give you an update and I'll share that with you. So that's it, family. I'm running late. And I know it's a little late on the East Coast, so I appreciate those of you who stuck around and waited for me to make my way through this traffic and get back to you. I um, wanted to come and just um, share with you where they are in Fort Worth in terms of trying to um, explain away something that you just can't explain away. And um, please, 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 please be vigilant, stay focused, and uh, make sure that interim police chief Ed Krause, if he really wants to be the police chief, he needs to get this one right. So we're going to keep an eye on it and I'll keep talking to you about it. I'll keep deciphering code talk when he says it. I'll explain it to you and tell you what you need to ask him when you have an opportunity. And hopefully, hopefully we'll get justice for this family. And um, Atiana Jefferson. Until next week, family. Be good and be safe.